Hello everybody, you're listening to The Arch on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. This is the weekly radio show where we chat about the local arts news, we have a different guest than each week, we play local unsigned and or independent music, we head over to the Rylight Zone for a short story and or some poetry, and we catch up with Twanglin' Jack Ford in the Yolk Shed for a weekly album review. As always, you can find us on Facebook if you search for The Arch Show on Wickham Sound, you should be able to find us. We repeat on Wickham Sound on Monday nights, or on the Wickham Sound Listen Again, iTunes, Spotify, and wherever else you get your podcasts. You can also... Find us on Facebook. I don't know if I've said that. We're on, if you just search for Wickham Sound, you sh- uh, the art show on Wickham Sound, you should be able to find us. And you can email me here at the studio on dane.cobain at wickhamsound.org.uk. That's D A N E dot C O B A I N at wickhamsound.org.uk. So this week we are going to be uh, interviewing the very talented Betty Acorsi. But before we do that, we're going to head over to the Rylight Zone for the latest installment of Formerly, The Rise and Fall of a Social Network. This is a novel by myself, Dane Cobain. We've been serialising it in we- recent weeks, so you can listen to Catch Up if you missed an episode. It's also available as an audio book, an e-book, and a paperback wherever all good books are sold, also Amazon. So Formerly, The Rise and Fall of a Social Network. Chapter 15. The moving date edged closer, and the office looked even more like heap than usual. Most of the fixtures and fittings had been stripped from the walls and packed into boxes, surrounded by styrofoam and wrapped with heavy duty masking tape. Flick's desk had been disassembled and so had several of the others. Meanwhile, John had called in the decorators to try to spruce the place up. I had no idea what they were doing, but half of the office was covered with sheets and the other half was piled high with ladders, buckets, paintbrushes and overalls. Dan, scowled John, storming over as soon as I walked through the door. Where have you been? You're late. I checked my phone and glanced back at him. Sorry, boss, I replied, even though I wasn't. What's new? Oh, not much, you know. Just the biggest storm to hit the site since we started, and Flick's not here to deal with it. I can't even get hold of her on the phone. Her number's engaged. Must be those bloody journalists chasing her for a quote. Vultures, the lot of them. If she's smart, she'll say nothing until she speaks to me. I hope to God she's smart. She'll be fine, I told him. She's not stupid. What happened, anyway? Same thing that always happens, he grumbled. Someone posted a story without checking their facts or their priorities. Now it seems like everyone under the sun is after our blood, and don't get me started on the bloggers. Turns out that providing a service isn't good enough, and now people are questioning how we use their data. And how do we use it, I asked. In my entire time at the company, no one had ever explained it to me. Forget about it, he told me. Some things are better left alone. He patted me on the shoulder and walked away, leaving me confused and on my own in the middle of the office. I passed out at my desk and got woken up the following morning by the buzzer, which was ringing repeatedly and thwarting my efforts to nod back off. I glanced at my phone and took in the time, quarter to seven, and the flood of notifications that had flooded in overnight. I groaned and got ready for work. It was too early in the morning for surprises, but I had one anyway. Two parked police cars outside the office, and four policemen perched impatiently beside the buzzer. One of Niels's men let them in reluctantly, after thoroughly inspecting their IDs. Don't mind us said one of the policemen, the guy who seemed to be in charge of the operation. We're just doing our jobs. Yeah, the security guard replied. And so am I. But you're not the one who has to tell John Myers that you let the police into his office while he wasn't there. John was pissed off. No, more than that, he was livid. When I got hold of him to tell him what had happened, he virtually exploded down the handset, shrieking and cursing and threatening to take my job. I knew he'd regret it and apologise later. He needs me and I know too much, but that didn't make it any easier. Eventually he put the phone down. He was in the office less than 10 minutes later. John, Neil said, laying a hand on him as he entered the building. I'm sorry, it's not like they gave me any choice. They're the police, John, what else was I supposed to do? It was the first time I'd ever heard Neil sound scared, almost apologetic. Forget about it, he snapped. You've done enough. He shook free of Neil's and stormed into the kitchen, where England's finest were relaxing with the tea that I'd offered them, trying to stall them as much as possible while I waited for reinforcements. John greeted them with a scowl and led them silently through to the boardroom. Ten minutes later, Kerry and Neil's crossed the threshold, and I was no longer alone inside the office. "'What's going on?' Kerry asked. I shrugged. "'Oh, the usual. The police are here.' John took them through to the boardroom. "'What's it all about?' "'I have no idea,' I replied." but I have a feeling we're about to find out. Right on cue, the boardroom door opened and John led the policeman out. So if you'll excuse me, he was saying, as he attempted to usher them towards the door. I'm a busy man, and I'm sure you're busy men too. I'll take up no more of your valuable time. Outside the building, one of the officers paused and took John aside. We're not finished with you, Mr. Myers, he said. Don't forget, 
We have access to the results of the autopsy. In most cases, the victim and the murderer know each other, and it seems to me that no one knew him better than you and your employees. If one of you did it, we'll find out. And if you weren't responsible, you could all be in danger. Could be that the assailant targeted him because he worked for you. Thanks for your warning, John said, but I think we'll take our chances. Was there anything else that you wanted? I think that's about it, the officer said. Oh, and my name's Whitehouse, Sam Whitehouse. Here, take my card. You might need it someday. Two days later, I climbed into a cab with Flick and we headed to the airport. There was a hum of excitement in the air. Some of us, Kerry in particular, had no idea if we'd ever come back. For Kerry, the move to Palo Alto was a triumphant return to his homeland, despite the fact that he grew up in Iowa. Palo Alto was almost as alien to him as it was to us. Is everyone here? John asked, looking around at his employees. The team looked around uneasily. I started to wonder what I was doing and whether I'd made the right decision. I'd grown up in London and I'd spent most of my life in the city. I'd never been to America, not even for a holiday. I saw the same tension in the faces of my colleagues. Only Peter, John and Kerry remained immune. I felt uneasy for a different reason. I missed Abby. Although I'd always known that he'd be staying behind, I didn't expect him to be staying behind in a coffin. At that moment, I would have given anything just to hear his voice again, to talk about variables and new programming languages and to joke about the new responsibilities he'd have to take on when his firstborn arrived. We had plenty of time left over, but John still hurried us towards check-in as though he expected something to go wrong. He was right to worry. As we headed towards the desk, we were stopped in our tracks by a familiar face. The police officer from earlier that week, now out of uniform and without the backup of his buddies. Going somewhere, gentlemen? he asked. John laughed, a hoot of defiance that made passers-by turn their heads to look at him as they pushed their suitcases towards the check-in desk. Well, certainly, officer, he replied. Haven't you seen the news? We're a big deal on the internet. We're relocating to the States. Is that a crime? Relocating isn't, the policeman replied, but murder is. We have nothing on you or your team, at least not yet. Without sufficient evidence, I can't hold you here. You're free to do as you please. But if I find something, anything, then I'll be seeing you again. Be careful, Mr. Myers. The truth will out. John's smile faded as rapidly as it had appeared. He turned abruptly on his heels and marched towards the check-in desk. The rest of us followed him into uncertainty, into Formley's future to Palo Alto. That was the latest installment of Formerly the Rise and Fall of a Social Network by myself, Dane Cobain. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound, and this is Dan Pride with Days Like These. I can't hide Cause this feeling comes from inside But I'm pretty sure This ain't all there is So I start another chapter In my book I tell myself that this time I'll change my outlook But the nights go on and on And what I'm just seeing All the same songs and I wonder why I'm such an optimist On days like these I feel myself spin to last And I must believe that Days like this will come to pass When I get home, the night has started slow I don't know if I ever took all the cars a long old ring road But it, it doesn't matter now I'll try again tomorrow anyhow But I'll never stop trying I think that that's what's worst Cause I'm sick and tired of feeling second class It's just like it's always been Things have had to go out in the past No matter how hard I try Somebody new comes in and slips by And I'm sad to take the dust to say take the first On days like these I feel myself spin to last And I must believe that days like this will come to pass Just tell me the answer Oh, it's the right thing to 
same Cause I always get it wrong With every attempt that I make Just give me a reason What's the right thing to do Cause I'm hanging on a wire here Can you just give me a clue Mindset isn't good for anyone Cause some things are for winning But most are just for fun and it really doesn't matter If you're applauded or drowned in chatter But to me it seems the same in every place that I go Ones that really try and push down to a low The game has gone to a stage, everyone wants to be on top And you're only popular if you're gonna throw a massive strop When you're not welcomed as a superstar Or the next coming of whoever And people like me can only sit and say Well, whatever Cause you know this will get better sometime and somewhere And days of the years I wish you just didn't care on days Like These On days Like
That was Apollo by Betty Accorsi, and before that we had Days Like These by Dan Pride. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain, and we're joined now by Betty Accorsi herself. The first question, you'll remember this from last time, is what was the last book that you read and what did you think of it? This one, Mary Oliver, New and Selected Poems. Cool. Awesome. And how was it? It's good. I like a lot, Mary Oliver. I discovered like in a library, uh, sorry, in um, a bookshop uh, in Italy. Yeah. And I started to read the poem and say, oh my God, I want this book. <laughs> so I started to collect books by Mary Oliver with uh, her poems. Cool. Awesome. Very, very nice. Brilliant. So um, I want to talk a little bit more about Italy later, actually, but I thought a good place to start with you would be to ask uh, which instruments you play and how long have you been playing them? So I play saxophone and I sing and I played for since I was eight years old. So like a long time ago. <laughs> cool. And, and you, you've sort of studied, you know, like studied it, um, I don't know, like a you have you got like different do you have like grades and things like that we so in the uk we have like different grades yeah. or did you study so that i studied in conservatoire um, and there is like five years plus uh, three years of uh, um it's like a bachelor bachelor yeah. in a uh, classical saxophone and then i came here in england and i studied the uh, two year master at trinity and uh, goldsmith cool. i studied jazz. and and you do some teaching now as well right can you tell us a little bit yeah. about that so I'm teaching uh, at the moment with the music service in Brighton and Hove, and I have also like my private students. Uh, so I, I teach saxophone, clarinet, flute, piano, all sorts <laughs> of the instruments. Cool. <laughs> well, cool. And do you do you remember like how you got your start? What it was that first made you pick up an instrument? The first time when I pick up the saxophone, it was yeah. hard because uh, so like my teacher wanted me to play the clarinet, but for me it was too hard. So I started with the soprano saxophone when I was young and the guitar and then I left the guitar and I just uh, played the saxophone. Um, so at the moment, you're kind of you're focusing on your work with the Betty Corsi Quartet. Um, who, who is in the quartet and what instruments do they play? So there is Andy Hamill, that is a bass player well known in the, in the London area. Then uh, there is uh, Daniel Houston, uh, sorry, the pronunciation. Mm -hmm. Daniel Houston, that is a, a very good uh, um, pianist, and he also plays in different bands uh, in London. And then Scott McDonald, uh, that was a student with me at Goldsmith. Uh, cool. And he played also in original project as well. And then obviously yourself as well. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> cool. And so, um, you know, you've got this new the new album that you've uh, you've released. What can you tell us about it um, in terms of, uh, you know, the title, but also where did you record it and how did it kind of come about? So we recorded the last year and it's about Brighton. It's about six pictures of my favorite places in Brighton and nearby that I took during uh, the second lockdown. And uh, uh, each picture described like uh, a, a place uh, in Brighton that I, I love most. So it's beautiful because like inside the, the CD you can find that pictures, those pictures. So you can uh, connect the picture with the, with the song. And uh, yeah, I started to do this because there was like a lockdown, I didn't have any job. So I felt a little depressed. So I started to to go around the city and just take uh, taking just taking photos uh, of Brighton, Rotting Dean, and it was very very beautiful for me. And it helped me also to heal uh, during that time. Yeah. Period. And actually, one of the questions I've asked a, a lot of people, especially musicians who've been on the show, is uh, what what do you think it is about music that has helped people to cope with the pandemic? Um, you know, both in terms of creating music, but also listening to music as well. I think it was uh, very important for me. Like it was like a friend uh, to stay like every day. And uh, yeah, so it helped me yeah, to, to write. I wrote a lot of songs during the pandemic because uh, yeah, I, I was at home. <laughs> so there was nothing to do. Also with Andrea, my partner, we played a lot in the city. We did a lot of songs, uh, rehearsal. It was like a creative moment, I think. 
Cool, awesome. And you mentioned that, that so the album, a lot of the tracks on it, are, that it's inspired by some of your favorite places in Brighton. Can you tell us about a few of those places? Okay, so for example, uh, um, Ampollo is inspired by the Royal Pavilion. That is a very uh, beautiful, uh, um, like, no, it's not a monument, but it's, but yeah, it's a place, palace in, in the center of Brighton. And uh, it's very like um, a Chinese style, uh, Indian style together, mixed together. And it's very uh, opulent with a lot of uh, things, uh, re very rich. And uh, the another is, uh, um, I just remember, okay, Lively House, that is uh, um, for a about a pub in Brighton, it's called the Prince Albert, that is full of pictures of Jim Morrison, John Lennon, mm -hmm. so it's very colorful. Then there is a uh, um, King Arthur uh, walks in Rock Tindin, that is inspired by Rock Tindin Woods, that is a little village near Brighton. So there are, there are sort of, yeah, all sort of, there are like a story behind each song. So this is, I think, the catchy thing. <laughs> cool. And am I right in it? Did you, uh, you got some funding to help to, to sort of bring the album to, to life, right? Yeah. Can you tell us about that? So, so I won the Mobo grant by a musician, it is the music of black origin, because my album was a jazz album. And this helped me a lot because they gave me uh, 3,000 pounds to record my album and to promote the album. So I, I managed to contact a very good promoter who helped me a lot uh, to send uh, the, my album to the press. Uh, and also I got from this also the, the gig at Pizza Express in August. It was a very good uh, starting point. Cool. <laughs> well, and I was going to ask you whether you think whether you think it's harder in some ways being a jazz musician than say, um, you know, like a singer songwriter with a guitar or something like that. But I suppose it kind of opens up because you wouldn't have got that funding if you had been a singer songwriter with a guitar. So I suppose there are pros and cons to it. Yeah, there are like, uh, like for example, a musician has a lot of funding for different genres from mm. classical music, to pop to jazz. Uh, but yeah, th that one was very specific. Um, so I think I was very lucky <laughs> to win that grant and it helped me a lot. So I encourage other people to apply and, and see if they can get uh, this grant. It's very useful. Cool. And what, what is it about jazz as a genre that, that you love? So uh, about jazz, I like it because it's very open genre. So for me, it's like a pot where I can put other genres together, like uh, folk music, uh, uh, rock music. I can put them together in the jazz structure. Is a uh, yeah, I think it's very open. Like comparison, maybe to pop uh, or uh, other style classical music that maybe it's too restricted. Yeah. So I, I like jazz for this reason. Cool. And um, in terms of like when you sit down to write your music, so you've told us a little bit about what inspired the tracks, but how do you actually write a piece of music? Do you just sort of sit down and start playing and, and see where it takes you? Yeah, I start playing on the piano or um, sometimes maybe I have a melody in my mind and I just record with the phone and I come home and I start with the piano and say, oh, I can do this one like on the bass. But the, the thing is that when I finish the, the piece, I don't remember how I wrote the piece. <laughs> I don't know, it just become completely like blank, my my brain. It's a sort of, I don't know, trance. Yeah. So you write and then you say, okay, what have you done? Okay, it's beautiful. But you don't remember anything about what, why you wrote <laughs> this uh, not, not You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain. I'm here in conversation with Betty Yacorsi, and this is Betty Yacorsi with Looking at the Horizon.
That was Looking at the Horizon by Betty Accorsi. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain. And it's time for us to rejoin uh, Betty Accorsi herself for an interview. And so because of that, do you ever kind of surprise yourself? Like, do you ever write a piece of music and then you sort of play it or you listen back to it and you're, you're kind of like, wow, how did that come out of me? Yeah, 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 exactly. When, when I listen like the, the, the recorded album, I say, ah, oh, this is quite good. And I say, ah, oh, but it's me. I, I really <laughs> <don't> this <laughs> But it seems like another person sometimes. There is a strange process. <laughs> cool. So, um, are you and you've been playing shows as the quartet, right? Can you tell us about a few of the different places that you played? So I played at Pizza Express in August uh, before we did the release the gig uh, in um, at the Folklore Rooms in Brighton. Then in August the Pizza Express. Now we have a concert on the eighth of December at the Amstead Jazz Club. And uh, uh, next year in two thousand twenty-three we have the concert in March at the Crypt and the concert at the Jazz Cafe Posh cool. in April. So we cool. have a few concerts. Cool. And so obviously I, I knew you guys from you used to live here in Wickham and then you, you moved to Brighton. And I wondered, what was it that attracted you to Brighton? And uh, how does it feel now that you've kind of settled in and, and become, you know, native Brightonites? I like Brighton because uh, um, it, it has a lot of cultural things going on, but it's not uh, so big like London. Mm. So you can still, it's, it's through the sense of the community that they say, so you, you are part of something. So I, and also it's not just Brighton, it's all the coast, I think. The south coast is very nice, like rotting in. So there are a lot yeah. of uh, like green spaces. So if you if your day is very bad, you go to the south downs and everything becomes yeah. very nice. Cool. Yeah, I really like it. And, and you mentioned, uh, obviously you have a musician as a partner and, and I wondered what, what's that like for you? And do you think that maybe you get I don't know, kind of additional support and like that he understands you more because you are both musicians. Um, what's it like to, to have a partner who is also musical? Yeah, I think it helps to to have a partner that understands you. Sometimes when we play, we are ah, we 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 are a little angry with each other <laughs> because Andre is was a perfectionist. But uh, I think it's important to have a passion, a strong passion in common, like music. So it's yeah. good. And do you ever like, I don't know, like workshop your ideas for, um, you know, for the quartet? Do you ever workshop those with Andrea or or do you kind of just present him with them once they're done so that it's like all your vision, if that makes sense? So uh, Andrea helped us to record the album. So he was the sound engineer. Yeah. So sometimes I bring him uh, and uh, and if like one of the court of the, um, which is a member of the court uh, is uh, he, for example, the pianist, uh, he usually plays the guitar. Uh, so I use him like a jolly. <laughs> so, yeah. Cool. And I think I, I think I remember when I was doing my little bit of research. Am I right in thinking that you've won you've won a few awards? Or have you been nominated uh, for a few? I've won the, the Mabu Awards. So uh, what was that like and, and sort of how did that come about? Uh, so yeah, it's uh, it's an award, it's a sort of grant. So it's the same that I spring it was with a with the help musician. So I got this grant uh, that helped me to um, yeah to to write uh, and uh, record my music. So it, w it was very very good, important. Cool, cool. And so um, obviously you mentioned earlier that you you were sort of you were born and raised in Italy. And I wondered if your do you think your Italian heritage affects your music at all? I think uh, uh, yeah, in the sort of the research for the melody, so for a good melody, very like uh, a sort of opera and aria style things. So I think in this way, he helped me a lot to to listen a lot of opera and aria when I was a child. Yeah, so to compose like a beautiful, more beautiful melody, and then <laughs> <laughs> you can say this. Cool. And like, what what would sort of, I guess, success look like for you? What, what's your end goal for the for the quartet? Where do you want to take it? So I would like to have more gigs booked and play in some festival, and then uh, also like in England, but also like in Europe. And I think the next step will be yeah to do maybe another album. But first, I have to finish promoting this one, the yeah. Green Roots, and uh, yeah reach more visibility i guess 
Well, I, I suppose I was, I was going to say, I suppose you, you said during lockdown, you, you were spending a lot of time writing songs. Do you have like, do you have a bunch of ones that you didn't use for the album that you've got kind of ready to go? Um, we, we, I did some songs that will be in the second album of this lot in the city with Andrea. Yeah. Okay, cool. Cool. So and that... two, two songs for the court. And and sort of speaking of sloth in the city, how do you how do you manage that working on the on the you know being in two bands at the same time? Yeah, it's difficult, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's easy with Andrea because we live together, so yeah. we can um, we can work on things. Uh, it must but, uh, yeah, it, it must be time. like yeah, and it must be a lot to remember as well, right? Like for all of the parts that you play. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's it's hard. Then you have to rehearse with the with the chorus and then with the duo. So it becomes it's, ah crazy, but it's beautiful. So I like it. Cool. <laughs> and uh, so you mentioned like working on a second album at some point. Are you going to do something similar? Do you think? Are the, is it going to have a, like a theme of location again, or are you going to go yeah, in a different direction? I think the theme so would be the relationship between uh, um, like men and the nature. So how uh, men use the uh, like uh, nature to create art. So this is my main uh, subject of research. So I wrote the, a song uh, about Mary Oliver because uh, she wrote a lot of poems inspired by nature. So I was interested in see how uh, she mixed the, the wor words uh, with the nature aspect. So and, and another piece would be, for example, the relationship between the sun and the stained glasses. So how the stained glasses exist just if you have the sun and so the, the light coming through, otherwise you can't see yeah. the art. So I don't know, I, I, yeah, I like to, to focus on a research theme and then do the album. Yeah. Yeah, and and as you were saying, the the area you live in as well, with all that those kind of beautiful landscapes around you, there's there's plenty of nature that you can be inspired from, as well as that you know, as well as looking at how other people have, have been inspired by nature, you can be kind of inspired by nature yourself as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's so beautiful. It's very nice here. It's like you you are like into the nature. It's a um, good good place to live. Yeah, cool. Yeah, good place. So um, the, I only have the the one last question, really. And we've kind of covered we've kind of covered what's next for you. Um, but I also wonder, like, where can people go to find out more? Where can they listen to the album? Where, what what can they do to support you guys? So the album is on Bandcamp. Bandcamp as the Green Roots is under Betty Corsi Quartet, and uh, is also on Spotify. But if you are very gentle, you can <laughs> find if you want our album. And then uh, I am on uh, Instagram as bettacorsi.music and Facebook as bettacorsi.music. So it's yeah, I'm trying also to get more followers on Instagram because I think it's important to get you more visibility with yeah. videos. Yeah. Well, and that, and that's it. And then people can stay up to date with you and hopefully come to one of your shows as well. So sounds yeah. like a good excuse for a, a road trip to Brighton. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Big thank you to Betty Acorsi for joining me. You're listening to the Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain, and this is Betty Acorsi with Like a Tree. Brown.
That was Bad Like a Tree by Betty Accorsi. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain. And it's time now for us to head over to the Oak Shed for this week's album review, courtesy of Twanglin' Jack Ford. Steve Hillage, L. I was inspired to re-listen to this album and talk about it after hearing Jack Smith's interview on this show. Jack plays psychedelic music and makes psychedelic art and listed Hillage as one of his favourite artists. I first saw Steve Hillage playing with Gong at the Lyceum back when beer was 22p a pint with no discount for underage drinkers like me. Steve Hillage was one of the incredible number of musicians that came out of the Canterbury scene, famous for bands like Caravan, Soft Machine, Hatfield and the North and Egg, back in the late 60s and early 70s. This was considered the credible face of progressive rock and got played on the John Peel show. Unlike the often derided giants of the genre like Yes and ELP, with their overblown works of high pretension, and their musical athleticism. Steve Hillage left Gong and made some solo albums. His guitar playing is very melodic, a bit like Dave Gilmore. It is ideally suited to long, trippy instrumental pieces. There are bubbling synths and chanting. I saw him at Friars in Aylesbury and he had a device next to his guitar that looked like a spaceship, but had the purpose of increasing the sustain. The album L was an attempt at doing something commercial using the famous producer Todd Rundgren. The standout track is probably a version of Donovan's Hurdy Gurdy Man. If you ever see a list of the worst Beatles songs, there is a good chance it will contain the George Harrison track, It's All Too Much. I have even seen it on a list of the worst George Harrison Beatles songs. Well, I always loved that song. It is the only reason to buy the Yellow Submarine soundtrack and I absolutely love the Steve Hillage version on this album. The last time I saw Steve Hillage live was when he made a surprise appearance at the Reading Festival, guesting with the shouty punk layabout Sham 69. Steve Hillage, L. Big thank you to Twangler Jack Ford for this week's album review. Thank you to Betty Accorsi for being this week's guest. Thank you to everyone whose music I played. As always, you can find us on Facebook if you search for The Art Show on Wickham Sound. You should be able to find us. You can email me here at the studio on dane.cobain at wickhamsound.org.uk. That's D-A-N-E dot C-O-B-A-I-N at wickhamsound.org.uk. And I'm particularly keen to hear from poets, performers, musicians, people involved in the local art scene, people with stories to share, MP3s, etc. Don't hesitate to get in touch. We're also repeat on Wickham Sound on Monday nights. We're on the Wickham Sound Listen Again. We're on iTunes, Spotify and wherever else you get your podcasts. So I'm going to leave you with one last tune for this week and this is Steve Winch and the Inception with Walk a Crooked Mile. I'll catch you next week. Still they hold